Hey, greetings again, YouTube. Welcome back. So, uh, I know I promised this video a while ago, but I got caught up with holidays and whatever. So, uh, anyway, this is the 25407 schematic. Uh, probably the most common, unremarkable Commodore 64 board out there. There's a whole ton of them in the wild. And we're going to deal with getting the Quarry dot clock working, uh, generated from the Quarry, injected back into the board, and working in both PAL and NTSC modes. So um, if you need more information on this, look at previous videos. Uh, there's the, the 5 volt machine I did it to, and I did a video on the 25466. This is gonna be a much shorter video on just how to do the same thing on the 407 board. So these schematics came from Zimmers.net and uh, they're, they're split into two different files. So I have split left and right here on the screen, the two different files you get from Zimmers. So going over the dot clock, um, pin 22 of the VIC is what is the consumer of the dot clock that's generated by the onboard oscillator on the Commodore 64. In a previous video, I might've said it was pin 21 um, I was convinced it was until I looked at the schematic again today. So A, I'm sorry if you started looking for the dot clock on the wrong pin, and B, it pays to always check the schematics even if you think you know what you're doing. So anyway, it comes out of there down to cartridge slot six, and then just tells you dot clock in the cute little bubble to reference the other schematic file. So moving straight across the board, here is the dot clock circuit from the left side. And as you can see, it hits a cap to ground to probably just help keep the circuit stable and happy. And ferrite bead 17 is what actually links the LS629 in the VIX section to these traces that go out to the, to the devices that need it. So this should be a real quick and easy one. Just remove ferrite bead 17 and inject your clock back onto the line somehow. So that is what we're gonna do today. All right, here's today's patient. And I'm working out of a laundry room today, so hopefully it doesn't sound too terrible. But uh, um, here is an unremarkable 25407 board. About the only thing that's been changed on it is the PLA. Um, this was my first computer. This is the board I've had forever and a day. Uh, PLA crapped out on it sometime back in the 80s. And uh, yeah, I sent it to a repair shop. They fit that white socket and threw that on there. Other than that, this board is, is about as generic as they come as far as 25407s go. There's nothing else done to it. So if you have a stock machine and you're trying to do the minimal amount of work to it, that's kind of the goal today is to not butcher up the board too bad. Let's just get a modern Vic in there. So uh, if we flip them on, you'll see we have our clock. It's bouncing like hell all over the place. Maybe that's the scope. Let's see. Now let's just hit the auto magic button. No, uh, I think it's just a bad connection on the probe. There we go. There's our clock. And he's bang on 81818. I'll zoom in a little, see if you can see that better. But that is what a stock healthy dot clock looks like. And actually it was out of sync a little bit when I first fired this board up. So that's what that little adjustment cap does in the middle. You can you know, get that frequency bang on where you want it. So um, zooming in on the board a little bit, that should be a decent view. Uh, here's our guy, Ferrite Bead 17. And here, let me shut this off before I short something out. And yeah, he's just linking the output of that 629 into pin 22 there and trace that. I'm not exactly sure how the trace gets there, but it eventually gets to the, uh, the cartridge slot. So um, should be pretty simple just to pop this bead out and pop something in its place. So by something in its place. We have a quarry. This is the same module I used in the other video. I just borrowed it out of that other machine. Um, so it's it's already set up with the firmware. It has the dot clock being output. We'll zoom in a little bit there so you can see on that LSO5 chip. And it's going into a wire with a 32 ohm or 38 ohm resistor. It's a 30 some odd ohm resistor on there to do a little bit of current limiting. So we can drop him right in the board and then plug that resistor 
into where ferrite bead 17 was because we're going to take him out of there or I thought of something else to keep things a little more modular is just come right around and we'll tack him right onto the quarry module on pin 22 there because that'll electrically hook up with everything else so I'll uh, I'll spare you the soldering but I am going to desolder ferrite bead 17 there and get this thing plugged in All right, here's a little patient with ferrite bead 17 removed, gone out of there, and it, it was super easy to do that. I, I just reflowed a little bit of fresh solder here from the top side of the board, and using the chip lifter, just slightly, tiny bit of pressure on it as I heated it up with the iron and just popped it out from the top side of the board. So if you wanted to do this in the machine, you still have a bottom shield on the board, any of that other stuff, you wouldn't have a problem. That thing comes out super, super easy. Don't be afraid. And that's the whole point of my videos. Don't be afraid to mod these things. It's, uh, you're, you're not gonna, you're not gonna do anything terrible to them. So anyway, bright bead's gone. I removed the Vic. I cleaned the socket and put a little bit of socket lube in there. And uh, here is the quarry board. And like I said, all I did was pull that wire around and solder it right onto pin 22 there where it comes out of the board. So it's, there's nothing else going on there. There's no, no caps, no resistors, no nothing except for that one resistor that we added in there that's heat shrimped inside there. So now this thing should just pop on in. To our crappy socket. Thank you Commodore for using the most quality sockets on the face of the planet. And uh, yeah, there we go. That's all there is to it. So, you know, if you're going to do this permanently, you might shorten this wire some. It doesn't need to be anywhere near that long. But it still does fit in the can. You'd probably almost get the can back on here if you wanted to, but I'm not going to bother. And you would, uh, you'd want to run a switch from here. This is your NTSC and PAL switch, right? So I just have this dip switch on here. This is a board I use for testing and whatever. But if this is going to be permanently installed in a case, which I might wind up doing, just pop a, uh, a switch on those two headers and run them out somewhere. So here, let's uh, back up a little, take a peek at our scope, and I guess I should plug the board back in. And we should get a clock again. Yeah, look at that. 8.1818, blah, blah, blah. The amplitude's a little lower than it was, but I think it's still plenty to drive what it's gotta drive, because the, you know, the Vic uses it whenever you plug in the cart slot. Um, the amplitude on the dot clock seems to be uh, less pissy. <laughs> or having low amplitude will, will cause less problems than, say, the, uh, the V2 clock, like when I was playing with all those 6502s. The amplitude on that circuit seems to matter more than the dot clock does, so I wouldn't worry about it being a little lower. Um, you could probably adjust that at, uh, was it C36, I think it was on the schematic if you need to get more amplitude out of it. I don't think we're gonna have a problem there, so I'm not gonna bother. Again, very, very simple mod here. Just pop out one ferrite bead and do this little above board mod to the quarry and plug it in. Super, super simple. Don't be afraid to take an iron to your machine. So uh, now that's done, I suppose I should plug this thing into some kind of monitor and see if it still works. All right, here we go. We're rigged up with an SD to IEC, a Link 232 Wi-Fi modem from DeBone. Go buy one of those modems, they're awesome. And uh, let's fire in the hole. All right, uh, we are capturing through the cheapest USB capture device on Amazon. I think I paid like 12 bucks for this thing and it is a piece of crap. Um, on a respectable monitor or whatever. You don't get a lot of the artifact and you see, you know, going vertically up the screen and stuff like that. Um, I, I mean, really, it is the jail bars causing that that are just inherent to the C64 design, not just the VIC, but the main board as well. Uh, it's also the stock modulator and everything else. So it, this, this USB device seems to really exacerbate any kind of garbage that comes in. Um, on a decent monitor or TV or, you know, real, you know, Commodore 1702 or whatever, uh, you probably wouldn't see any of that at all. Um, maybe we'll do a, uh, 
you know, a little before picture at the end. I'll, I'll throw the original Vic back in it or something so we can see the differences in, in the video. But this is really about the dot clock, not so much the video output. That might just wind up being another video. So anyway, um, here we're going to shut them off. I'm going to flip them over to PAL mode, that little dip switch I had hanging off the board. And he boots right up in PAL mode. Very nice, very nice. All right, I'm going to flip back over to MTSC and we will load strike term. Now this is a stock machine, so strike term is probably going to take like five minutes to freaking load. Man, the file browser takes forever to load even without some kind of accelerator. So here, we'll, we'll get the load going, then we will cut to when it's done loading. Like hell, just to load the directory takes forever. I might wind up modding the hell out of this machine too. It needs to be faster. But uh, all right, we're loading the terminal program. We'll come back when it's done. All right, here we are, we're loaded up. Terminal mode. And we can talk to our modem at 38.4. That's kind of awesome. I'm glad that's working. Can we log into my favorite BBS? Yes, we can. No corruption or anything, so I'd say that's a good solid test. Now we're gonna kill it. We're gonna kick over to PAL and make sure our modem works in PAL mode as well. So be back shortly. All right, all loaded up in PAL mode. There we go. And uh, yeah, alive and cranking. And again, you know, it looks a little blurry in PAL mode. That's this janky ass capture thing. <laughs> it, uh, it, it'll look a lot better on a real monitor. Please don't let this be a demonstration of the Kawari's awesome video because it's not. I mean, this machine is not exactly the best outputting machine to begin with and it is the crappiest capture card on the face of the earth. So we'll try to connect. I'm sure it'll work, but I'd like to get a little more data flowing across the thing. Yeah, there we go, good stuff. No corruption, everything came out clean and good. If your dot clock's off, it's either not gonna work at all in most cases, or if it is working and you get a lot of weird corrupted data and whatever else on your screen, then you know that's, that's indicative of the dot clock being a little off or out of phase or whatever. So, yep, we are successful. All in all, pretty happy, pretty simple little fix to do to uh, get your dot clock working if, if you need those types of carts. So anyway, uh, there'll be some more stuff coming up. I have some Quarry large boards. I'm testing a lot of different configurations. Uh, there's a Neo 128 in the works. I got an, an Amiga 500 that's gonna be making a showing here at some point. So if, uh, if you find any of what I do interesting or whatever, hit subscribe, come back and see us again. So anyway, that's that for now. Thanks for watching and uh, we're always happy to help. Uh, Randy's awesome. I help wherever I can. If you need any help doing anything with your, your quarry or, or your machine in general, uh, join us in Randy's Discord. I'll put some links below for, for some of the stuff we talked about today. And uh, yeah, get your soldering iron, get out, do some stuff, and feel free to hit us up for help. Take care, everybody.